Hello everybody, I am uh, Philippe Cole from Belgium, member of the uh, Guideline Committee of the ESC and we are here today uh, in London at the uh, 2015 ESC Annual Congress to discuss uh, the guidelines, new guidelines and in particular today the guidelines on the prevention of sudden cardiac death. And here with me are uh, Silvia Priori from Italy who was the chair of these guidelines and Dirk van Veldhuizen from the Netherlands who was a uh, member of these guidelines and representing the Heart Failure Association. So Silvia, if I may ask you the first question, why do we need new guidelines on this topic? These guidelines are very needed because the last version of guidelines for prevention of sudden death was 2006. So we can imagine that in almost 10 years, you know, major advancement has have occurred. And I think that therefore is important, especially because 50% of the sudden cardiac death almost occur in people without a known cardiac disease. Right. So the fight has to be maintained at a high level to reduce the number of deaths for sudden cardiac death. Okay, thank you. And the second question would be then, uh, what are the most important, the most relevant recommendations from these guidelines? I'm going to ask the question to both of you first. What is your opinion, Dirk? Well, I think uh, uh, using device therapy in heart failure and LV dysfunction is very important as it's really uh, increased uh, the outcome for, for many patients with LV dysfunction and heart failure. But it was very necessary to further refine the role of device therapy in heart failure. And I think with, with uh, looking with the guidelines at exactly the information available, we've been able to further refine how we should use ICDs and particularly CRTs. So we've defined uh, exactly when with the QRS of uh, 12150 and with the left bundle or no left bundle, we know now exactly when we should use these devices. And I think with these guidelines, we've done that. So I think that's important in these guidelines. Silvia, from your point of view? Yeah, it's interesting, Dirk, you're talking about the most severe uh, patients, the very high risk. I also think that it's important to talk uh, about the patients who are at lower risk, but it's very important to identify them. So I would say that an important part is the one that concerns identification of young people, athletes at risk of sudden death. And there is quite a lot that people will find in these guidelines that try to guide identification of these individuals through screening of the population or screening of the athletes before they participate into sport. So I think that that is where I would like to see a lot of reading and hopefully a message that reduces sudden death. Of course. Yeah, and I completely agree with that. I'd like to add with that because with LV dysfunction and heart failure, we know that these patients are at risk for dying suddenly and we know these patients are sick to begin with. But I think with patients with much less advanced disease or basically healthy, uh, sudden death is one of the most devastating things in, in life. And we need to be able to identify these patients and, and we can do something about it with drugs or, or with ICDs and those kind yeah. of devices. So this is very important. And for these young patients without previous history uh, who uh, suffer of sudden cardiac death, uh, how far should we go with autopsy, molecular autopsy, for example? Can you give us some uh, feedback there? Yeah, it's very important to define the line of uh, you know, what is an important screening and what is an excessive screening that costs a lot and is not actually improving the identification. There are big debates, but I think that some level of screening of individuals at some risk, like the athletes, is very important. Today is known that patients with right ventricular cardiomyopathy have a mortality increase by competing in uh, agonistic sports. So I think that in athletes is very important to have a screening. Genetic is also very useful, but it requires the identification of the electrocardiographic markers or the echocardiographic markers for the population. So the guidelines are actually trying, we made an effort in trying you know, to uh, draw a pathway to define how to use genetic testing, when to refer patients to tertiary centers for the identification of this substrate that facilitate the unexpected death of young. Dirk, anything you would like to add on this well, part? Yeah, I completely agree with that. And, and, and again, uh, patients with, with uh, no disease are very difficult to identify. It's a, it's a matter of how much do you want to do in these patients. I personally think that genetic testing will tell us a lot more in the future, but we're just at the beginning of that. But in my field in heart failure, uh, for example, patients with heart failure and normal ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction also have a very poor outcome and die suddenly a lot as well. And we don't know why these patients die. So we're only at the beginning of 
of seeing what's going on with these patients. And Interestingly, yeah. also the acquired sudden death have some familiar trends. Absolutely. And so maybe also there in the future we may have some genetic markers, but not in this version of the guidelines. No, not yet, unfortunately. Right. An important part also is the uh, ICD field, implantable cardiac defibrillator. Any new technologies, implantable or not, that you recommend in the guidelines? You want to take that? Or? Yeah, sure. You know, the, there are some technological advancements. For example, the subcutaneous ICD is an important innovation and is both for the patients with uh, uh, high risk and the patients uh, with uh, lower risk, uh, but still, you know, significant, and especially for the young people. The subcutaneous does not have transvenous leads, and that is the key point mm -hmm. that tries to and seems to be promising in that reduce the complications related to the transvenous approach. And I, I agree with that too. I think initially we were completely enthusiastic about ICDs and also about CRT, and it's, it's, it's justified. I mean, these devices have been fantastic, but now we start to see patients also who have replaced leads and get more leads and they get problems of their leads as well. And I think the subcutaneous ICD is really for, for patients that, is, that have never had anything else or had a cardiomyopathy, young patients, it's much better to give a subcutaneous ICD. So that's one of the... Yes. Well, thank you very much. I think these guidelines are great. Uh, they are now available on the ESC website in a pocket version, so I hope that uh, everybody will read them and use them. Uh, I think they are really timely, comprehensive, they do cover uh, all aspects. So to summarize, we discuss uh, the indication of treatment for patients that have uh, had acute events, that have uh, cardiomyopathies and dilated hearts or obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Also the cases of uh, young patients who suffer sudden cardiac death, a type of autopsy or molecular autopsy, the screening uh, and the genetic counseling for these type of patients and the use of new uh, technology device in the field of uh, ICD uh, with implantable leads or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Congress. Thank you.